Okay, welcome back. We are now in macro unit one. This is screencast one. The unit is indicators of economic performance. And the um, content for this screencast is introduction to macroeconomics and GDP. So we just spent a semester talking about microeconomics um, and now we're going to do macroeconomics. That's the second semester, second um, AP exam that you'll be taking in May. Um, and in this screencast we're going to talk about, or I'm going to talk about, um, the difference between microeconomics and macroeconomics, and then we're going to get into maybe the most important concept in all of macroeconomics, uh, which is something called GDP. Alright, so first let's talk about what microeconomics uh, is versus macroeconomics. Microeconomics was about individual units in the economy. So in the forest and the tree analogy, microeconomics would be the trees, and macroeconomics would be the forest. Macroeconomics is about everyone taken together. It's about the entire economy, not just little units within the economy. So, for example, microeconomics was about questions like, should I break up with my boyfriend? You know, what should individuals do? Or should I stop eating seconds um, before I get too full? That would be a microeconomic question. Again, a question about an individual unit in the economy being you. Uh, what price should I charge to maximize my profits if I'm a business owner? <clears throat> Again, a business being an individual unit within the economy. Macroeconomics, on the other hand, is about pretty much all of us. You know, what's going on not just with you or me or one business, but the entire economy. You know, what's going on with our entire nation? Or, if you look at things even more generally, what's going on with the entire world? So that's essentially the distinction between microeconomics and macroeconomics. Micro, small, macro, big. Now we're looking at a general picture of the overall economy on a national level or even an international level. Now if you go back to the central problem of economics, the problem of scarcity, the idea that there's not enough stuff to go around to meet all human needs and wants, then when we start talking about the national economy, the first thing we're going to be looking for is a way to measure how well the economy is doing. We want to know for our country and other countries want to know for their countries, you know, to what extent are we satisfying those human needs and wants? Now we could be talking about basic needs like food, clothing, shelter, that kind of stuff, medical care. We could be talking about less basic, but just as strong needs. Um, but in either case, we're talking about the extent to which various economies around the world satisfy the basic fundamental problem of economics, which is scarcity. So the measurement that economists have come up with um, to try to capture how well or the extent to which we're satisfying our needs and wants is a concept called gross domestic product, abbreviated GDP. The definition of GDP is the total market value of all final goods and services produced in a country in a given year. And you'll notice in the little presentation, I've italicized a couple of those words, market value and final goods and services, or the word final. So when you see the word market value or the phrase or term market value, what we're talking about is a monetary measure, a dollar figure. So GDP is measured in dollars. We're going to get a dollar value of all the final goods and services produced in the country in a given year. The idea being that the more stuff we make in dollar terms, the more human wants and desires we're satisfying. Now obviously, this is a materialistic measure. It's measured in dollars. So to the extent that non-material things make us happy, things like love, hugs, kisses, snuggles, that kind of stuff, um, that's not going to get included in GDP. So we're not going to really measure, you know, perfectly the extent to which human beings are satisfied, but we're going to try to measure the extent to which they're satisfied, at least in terms uh, of material things. Alright, so GDP is a monetary measure, and the other part of this definition that I italicized is that it's a measure of only final goods and services. And let me try to explain why that word final is in there. We're going to distinguish between what we're going to call a final good and what we're going to call an intermediate good. So for example, if we're building a car, the car 
is the final good. That's the good that's eventually sold to the consumer. Now, in the course of building that car, let's say we're talking about a Ford car, Ford might have bought a windshield from some windshield manufacturer to put into the car to then sell it to us. Now, that windshield would be an intermediate good, a good that's essentially used to produce the final good. And the idea is that we don't want to count intermediate goods, we only want to count final goods when we calculate GDP. GDP is a measure of the dollar value of the stuff that we produce. So the problem with counting intermediate goods is that if we did that, we'd be counting goods twice. We simply want to count the value of the car. So for example, if this car was eventually sold to somebody for $20,000, that $20,000 price theoretically incorporates or includes the value of that windshield. So if we were to count the windshield when it was sold to Ford, and then count the car when it's sold to the final consumer, we'd essentially be counting that windshield twice. And that's why we don't want to count intermediate goods, goods that go in to make products that eventually become final goods, because that would be a kind of double counting. Now, for the same reason, we're not going to count sales of used goods, because what we're trying to get is a dollar figure for the stuff that was produced this year. So if somebody goes out and buys a car from 1995, they're spending money on stuff, but they're spending money on stuff that wasn't produced this year. So if a good is used and sold in the economy, we're not going to count that, because again, we're trying to get a measure of the amount of stuff that we produced this year. All right, so before we get into how we really calculate GDP, let's talk about a couple of other things that aren't included in GDP. We've seen that intermediate goods aren't included when we count GDP, and we've also seen that used goods aren't counted when we calculate GDP. Other things that aren't counted is when nothing is produced. So, a few examples of this. First off, purely financial transactions. If we have a purely financial transaction, a transaction with just money's changing hands, but not for a good or service, we're not going to count that as a part of a GDP because nothing was produced. So for example, stock and bond trades, private transfer payments. A private transfer payment is kind of like when your grandmother gives you $20 for your birthday. That's what a transfer payment is, a transfer of money from one person to the next. And a private transfer payment would be a transfer from a private individual to another private individual. So when your grandmother gives you 20 bucks for your birthday, we're not going to count that as a part of GDP because nothing was produced. Similarly, public transfer payments, which are the same thing but from the government. So things like welfare, social security payments, uh, scholarships that the government might be giving you. If the government's giving people money, not because they've produced anything, but just to help them out, that's a public transfer payment, and that also isn't counted as part of GDP. If no money changes hands, the transaction's also not going to be part of GDP, even if something was produced. And the reason for this is just for practical purposes. The government's trying to keep track of this number. But if no, num if no money changes hands for a transaction, it's impossible to keep track of. So for example, if I decide to build a treehouse for my kids, well, something's being produced that year, but since no money is going to be changing hands, that's not going to get captured as a part of GDP. Or for example, if I decide to tie my own shoes, well, that's a service, and it's a service being produced this year. And technically, if we really wanted to count GDP as a measure of all the stuff that was produced this year, we would count that. But since no one can figure out exactly when it is that I tie my shoes, or exactly how much it's worth because no money's changing hands, we're not going to count that as a part of GDP either. So any work done for yourself doesn't count as a part of GDP because no money's changing hands. Any unpaid work that you do doesn't count as GDP, even if stuff is produced, again, for the practical reason that it's very hard to figure out when these transactions take place and how much they're worth. All right, now, there are two approaches to calculating GDP, one of which you just kind of have to know about, and the other one you have to really, really understand. 
The first approach is called the expenditures approach. Expenditures meaning a uh, fancy way of saying uh, spending. So this is called the spending approach. And what this approach says is that if you want to calculate GDP, all you need to do is simply add up everyone's spending on all the goods and services. So the idea being that if we want a measure of how much stuff was produced, why don't we just count how, much, how many dollars people spend on goods and services, and that would be a way to capture how, much, how many goods and services were produced in a given year. The second approach is called the income approach. And this is the approach you just kind of have to know about, but don't have to know in depth. The income approach says, well, you remember that circular flow diagram that we re re uh, referred back to all throughout first semester? You'll remember that one person's spending becomes another person's income. If that's the case, then another way to calculate GDP would be to add up everyone's incomes. Because if everyone's spending turns into somebody else's income, then that would be a second way to capture GDP. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Remember, this is what the circular flow model looks like. And the idea was that households, that's us, we buy goods and services in the product market from businesses. Businesses buy resources in the resource market from us. So essentially, we can capture GDP by just dipping our little finger into a couple of these arrows and calculating what that total amount is. So for example, businesses sell goods and services to us, here's the goods and services, and we spend money. So if we were to measure the amount of this arrow, how much money we're spending on goods and services, that would be one way to calculate GDP, and we'd call that the expenditures approach. Now when we spend money at these businesses, these businesses take that money and they use it to buy resources. They buy land, labor, capital, entrepreneurial ability, and in return, they pay us. If we're labor, they give us wages. If they use our land, they give us rent. So this arrow represents income to households. So if we were to just dip our finger into this arrow and measure that, we should also be able to capture the amount of GDP. Because again, one person's spending is another person's income. When we go out and spend money to buy goods and services, that money eventually comes back to us in the resource market. So we can do it either way, the expenditures approach by measuring this arrow, or the income approach by measuring that arrow. And we're gonna go with the expenditures approach as I mentioned in a second. All right, so again, what the income approach would do would be to say, add up everyone's income from whatever they do, like babysitting, so that would be wages if we're talking about labor. It would be top rent if we're talking about land. It'd be interest if we were talking about capital. And then whatever that number is with some minor adjustments would be a measure of GDP. Now the expenditures approach again says add up all the money everyone's spending on goods and services. Instead of measuring people's incomes, let's just measure their spending. Now that's the approach we're going to go with, and we'll get into more detail with that approach in the next screencast. So is it any wonder people are afraid of technology? Technology! Oh